We, we are live, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. Uh, it is 10 o'clock. I'll call this meeting to order. Welcome to the Gray Bruce Board of Health meeting for Friday, March 26th. Aaron, let's begin with the roll call, please. Can you can you hear us, Madam Chair? I can hear you. Oh, they can hear us. We cannot hear you. It's showing that Aaron's on mute. We had that audio with that last night or the other day too. And we are we're just connecting to a different system for for sound, just okay. in case that's the reason. Would you want to try it now, Madam Chair? Um, I'll start at the beginning. We'll call this meeting to order. Can you hear me now? I cannot hear you, Madam Chair. Uh, Matt, if you can hear the IT, please. Darren. Anne, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you just fine, Sue. Yep, I can hear you, Sue. I can hear you, Sue. I can hear Sue. everybody else uh, just fine as well. I can hear Dr. Era as well. Yeah, I can hear Dr. Era. It's showing that uh, Aaron is a co host that she's muted for can can you try talking now Sue? yes and i can hear you now aaron but it still says you're muted okay we can hear you now madam chair all right so aaron you can hear me yes i can hear you all right so we're going to start again um, we'll call the meeting to order. Welcome to the Gray Bruce Board of Health meeting for Friday, March the 26th. Erin, let's begin with the roll call. Okay. Um, Ann Eady. Present. Brian Milne. Here. Brian O'Leary. Present. Chris Peabody. Present. Mitch Twillen. Present. Selwyn Hicks. Selwyn Hicks. Helen Claire T Tingling. Good morning, Aaron. Good morning. Alan Barfoot. Present. And Nick Saunders. Yes, ma'am, I'm here. Hello. Okay. All right, thanks, Aaron. Uh, Selwyn Hicks uh, will probably join us shortly. I know he's in meetings, had meetings before this one. So good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to our viewing public, to the staff and to the media. At this time, I'll ask if there's any amendments to the agenda. Madam Chair, if I may request uh, the in-camera item, uh, the update uh, through a third party has not come through completely, so I, I would recommend deferring to another month. Okay, thank you. So the in-camera meeting has been removed from the agenda, so I will ask for approval of the agenda as amended. I have Al Barfoot moving it and Brian Millen on second. All in favor? Madam, Madam Chair, could I ask for uh, something to be added to the agenda? Yes. Just, I, would, I would also, uh, you know, uh, move it that way. I just would like if Dr. Eric could give us an update on uh, 
the question had been arisen before on whether we're receiving the uh, proper percentage of vaccines in Gray Bruce compared to what other uh, health units are receiving around the province. And yes. Madam Chair, that could be within the update uh, from the AMOH, if you wish. We can make it as a different item uh, also. Um, I think under your update would be a good spot for it. Sure, that's fine. All right, so we do have a mover and seconder. All in favor of the amendments to the agenda. That is carried. Thank you. Um, Madam Chair, sorry, Madam Chair, if I uh, may request just introduction of Dr. Zaid, who recently joined us as a physician consultant, if possible. Yes, thank you. Dr. Zayed, would you like to say a few words or are you okay? Yes, thank you very much. I am really, uh, it's a pleasure to, to join uh, the Great Bruce Public Health Unit and uh, uh, to join the team here. Uh, I am, I'm really uh, very, uh, very happy to, to, uh, to join the team. And uh, I, um, I am originally from Ontario, so it, it is really, um, it's a pleasure to be back. Uh, the, my experience in Saskatchewan for the last couple of years was really a, a rich experience and I hope I can, I can uh, have a, an input in uh, the great work that is, uh, that, is, uh, that is going here. Thank you. Welcome aboard. Thank you very much. Okay, at this point, does anyone have a disclosure of pecuniary interest? Seeing none, if one should arise during the meeting, you may declare it then. Uh, item 5.1, I have uh, the minutes from Friday, March the 5th. And uh, we can start, or I will just say um, there is one change with those minutes on um, item three says that the agenda for March 5th be approved as amended. We did not have any amendments to that ad agenda. So I'd like to have that um, removed, that as amended. And there are a couple of um, uh, grammar uh, corrections that I would like to see. These are um, minutes are kept as a document and I'd like to see them formally uh, corrected with uh, you know, the proper grammar and formatting. So just that one change that we'll put uh, in the uh, approval to adopt with the changes as amended. Did I get a mover and seconder? Al and Chris Peabody, all in favor? That is carried. And of course, if, if there's questions, please uh, raise your hand. Item 5.2 is uh, the Board of Health Executive Committee meeting from March the 19th. I need a mover and seconder to put that on the floor. Uh, Brian O'Leary and Mitch Tulin. Any questions or comments? Okay, I'll call the question, all in favor? That's carried, thank you. So next on the agenda is our correspondence and news releases. Um, does anyone have any comments about uh, the correspondence? I think uh, item 6.14, Motion from the Chippewas of Nawash Unseated First Nation re-board appointment. Um, Nick, I wonder if you would like to speak to that. Hello. Hello, we can hear you. Okay, yeah, no. Um, our, uh, the Chippewas of Nawash uh, Chief and Council um, appointed me to your board there, um, if you are so willing to have me on there. Uh, I, I think that we've had a, a good start to a working relationship with the health unit, and I would like to continue to see it uh, move forward and uh, on and upward, uh, as we sort of like to say, um, with many ways. Thank you. Uh, I want to say on behalf of the board, we welcome your opinion and your comments, and very glad to see you have joined our board. Dr. Eric. Thank you. Would you like to comment? Certainly, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I connected with the Chief Medical Officer of Health Office to see uh, what uh, uh, next steps uh, we would have to have uh, Councillor uh, Saunders as, as uh, official member uh, for, for the Board of Health and uh, 
uh, my understanding from them, the if, uh, if, um, <clears throat> the next step forward would be uh, submitting an application to the province, similar to what we uh, um, did in the past. And uh, my understanding, uh, they they will uh, have full approval already in place since the the uh, chief. Uh, uh, for the Chiba and the uh, Nimwash uh, Council have already approved. Good. Thank you. Any further comments or questions? Helen Clare? Yes, uh, through you, I'd like to say to Nick, Nick, I, I heard you say that you're joining, quote, your board. And I want you now, as of today, to think of this as our board. So that you're thinking our board, no longer your board, because you are an important member around this table, your voice counts, and we're very grateful to have you here. Thanks, Helen Claire. Switch. Switch, yes. Uh, any further comments? If not, we'll move on to the news releases, quite a few again, which is good to get that information out there. Madam Chair, if I can uh, um, ask Drew to comment on the news releases today. Yep, the, uh, Madam Chair, the news releases as, as presented again, quite a few. They begin with really the time when the, we were about to roll out the uh, 80 plus uh, uh, vaccine and they cover uh, a number of uh, 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 issues related to COVID-19 as well as, as overdose, opioid overdose alerts in our community as well. That, uh, that opioid crisis continues to, uh, to migrate through our communities and uh, up into uh, with some uh, releases with respect to uh, the online booking and, and phone system. So if there's any questions on any individual one. Thanks, Drew. Any questions or comments? Uh, Brian Millen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm looking at uh, news release number uh, 15 and 16, I guess. There's a couple others that kind of relate to it. Perhaps Dr. Ayer is going to speak to the issue in his uh, update, but um, the recurring issues between us and the province regarding booking online and phone, um, is that issue getting resolved or is this going to be an ongoing issue? Because I'm hearing anecdotally from uh, people and media reports, social media that this, the, the, the online and the phone piece is a mess and it's discouraging people from getting vaccinated. It's confusing people. And I think it needs to, well, I know it needs to be fixed. Maybe it has been fixed, but uh, I'm wondering, is Dr. Eric going to speak to that in his update? If not, could he comment on it now, please? Cer certainly it's probably, we can comment on it now since the question uh, has been risen. Uh, it was, it would be to, to be included in the, um, in the update, and if you noticed in the minutes from the executive committee, we have uh, um, moved forward with uh, deploying our own booking system, uh, not as a replacement, rather as a hybrid system we're going to be using too. The uh, provincial system was piloted here, and from our point of view, all the steps that need to be taken were taken during the pilot, and later during the application. Uh, on the first week, uh, we had uh, a small number of clinics, and there was uh, a couple of glitches in the system. Um, we, we immediately raised them with the province and the provincial team worked on fixing them. The next week, this week, we had uh, 10 clinics and uh, different type of issues surfaced just because of the sheer number and the, and the type of uh, the process that they're going on the provincial side. Uh, we provide our uh, clinics uh, or, or Excel sheets for the clinics five days beforehand. We upload them in the system. And it seems for different reasons, these glitches happened. Um, we have been working with the uh, provincial system or the, the uh, ministry colleagues uh, to identify to them what the issues are based on uh, our callers and our observation. And uh, they have been working through them. Uh, for more technical points, if I can ask Matt to provide update on that since he is working with that team. Uh, certainly, uh, Dr. Era, there's uh, so the, the more technical parts, you don't have to worry about that. Uh, the, the more technical parts are, it, 
I have no other way to say this, but they are also changing their systems as uh, they grow and morph. Uh, think of it, this as a, so a rapid software deployment from their perspective. Uh, they are changing more or less as the, the ship is uh, uh, left the harbor and is going across the ocean. So uh, they're seeing different things happen to them. It's not always uh, us uh, that, that have the, the uh, experience the problems, but it's certainly other health units have. Uh, so they're also making changes to their systems uh, in an attempt to be a better service. Uh, there are some, I'll say, functionality gaps that have arisen and will not be uh, uh, covered, I would say, in the near future, uh, and, and another reason for us to be moving towards that, uh, our own booking system. Thanks, Matt. If, if I may provide a couple of concrete examples, just uh, usually concrete examples bring it home for, for our listeners uh, uh, past this, this room. Um, one example is uh, we, we had 10 clinics and on Monday when the public logged in, they couldn't see any one of them. By midday, three uh, clinics were showing on the system after the provincial colleagues uh, started working on it. Uh, right now we have all clinics on, online. Um, one of the clinics showed as completely booked so when, when the residents in Great Bruce would log in, we'll see it completely booked, so they need to move to another clinic. Uh, on, on the day we uh, went to the clinic, there was no uh, buddy sh who showed up. So we had contingency plan to uh, ask for, for other people and uh, with the help from the municipality and the hospital, also people who can qualify for it or, or at least to, to have people to have the vaccine. Uh, we have, by the way, uh, of mentioning this example, the um, school sector ready to be vaccinated anytime, and that's our contingency plan, and that's over uh, 2,000 people uh, ready uh, lists. Uh, nevertheless, we we uh, managed without using that contingency, complete contingency. Uh, other issues are related to callers um, entering uh, their postal code from towns in Grey Bruce and being directed to other health units. Again, some, some of these glitches uh, are easy to fix. Some of them uh, human error in the way the adjustment of the system happens. And uh, my understanding from my team and verify that it is not on our side. Um, the deployment of our own uh, booking system would allow us to um, uh, target certain groups based on the, uh, the uh, essential worker in phase two, for example, or other groups. The provincial system does a really good job based on age groups. So the 80 plus or 75 plus or uh, other uh, groups down the road. Nevertheless, if residents from Gray Bruce uh, who are 80 plus logged in in the system, they can see uh, other clinics that we assign for essential workers or for healthcare workers, and they can book in it. And that separation is limitation of the system and, and it, it just is. And that's why we're deploying our own system. I just wanna make clear uh, one point that we are still going ahead with the provincial system for age groups. And my understanding and trust that the provincial colleagues are gonna tweak these glitches. And it's important to remember, we, we get all of us calls, 20 calls, 30 calls of people who are frustrated or maybe more, but thousands of people have already booked and got the vaccine. And it's a process in, in, in development, and I trust it will be refined in the near future. Further comments or questions on the news releases or correspondence? Anne, Edie? Uh, I, I had just heard uh, anecdote uh, about a few in the border areas um, with the postal codes as well. And um, maybe uh, uh, Mitch, Mitch has received as well. So I think it was um, in border areas too, you have people uh, as to which county they're in and, and um, postal codes don't always match municipal boundaries, et cetera. So I, I'm, I'm thinking that uh, when you're referring to the, those types of things and they're being sorted out now. So 
that that's good because some people were frustrated trying to trying to get in um, to the provincial system. Just I've heard of a few cases, so uh, I'm. It makes me more comfortable too that we have our own booking system for for the other categories and as a backup. I, I think that will be good going forward. Thanks, Anne. Okay, I need a mover and seconder to receive the correspondence and news releases as presented. I have Brian Millen and welcome. I have Selwyn Hicks. All in favor? That's carried, thank you. So item seven, we have 7.1, the Medical Officer of Health update. This is the report on the COVID-19 vaccine survey. Uh, certainly, Madam Chair, thank you. Uh, to start, just to provide where we're at with the vaccine uh, process, the uh, phase one includes uh, four main groups. Um, all of them need to be completed by the end of March. All of them are offered the vaccine this week. Uh, there, there are one group that has been uh, slow in providing uh, the list, whether it is, uh, uh, whether it is uh, because people are uh, preferring not to get the vaccine right now or because of their own internal process. Nevertheless, uh, it has been offered to them and we expect that uh, there are going to be more participation in the coming two weeks. The long-term care sector and retirement home has been completed uh, first dose and uh, uh, second dose uh, has been offered this week and uh, next week. And the only barrier for leaving it till next week is the 28 days uh, between the first dose and the second dose. And that is for residents, staff, and essential workers. And uh, according to the provincial direction, it should be for the residents only as a second dose. Uh, I decided to take the heat on it and provide it to staff and uh, to essential workers. I, I know that sector has done amazing work and, and fatigue is uh, with COVID is in place and uh, we, we need to provide it for everybody in that sector. So that is uh, nicely completed first dose and will be completed next dose this week and next week. And, and uh, clinics are booked for that. Uh, healthcare workers for the Hospital system, it is offered for those according to the provincial uh, direction. And this week would be uh, the, the last group uh, from one of the hospitals. Uh, the uh, First Nation and, and uh, Councillor Sanders can, can speak a bit more to it. My understanding, there is good uptake. Uh, there is actually herd immunity over 45 last time I spoke with him. And uh, uh, it, it has been offered, will continue to be offered to the entire community as soon as they're ready. Uh, we, uh, 70 plus, we started providing um, the clinics for 70 plus this week. And, and it's worth mentioning that we had complete plan to provide it to schools and other groups from phase two earlier than April 1st, just because we, we managed, uh, I should quantify this part, if you asked me two weeks ago, I would say we have smaller shipments to finish uh, phase one by end of March. And I communicated with the general, uh, the task force for Grebrews uh, decided to write a letter and I conveyed that decision to the uh, general's team. And they were very responsive in upping our shipments. And that's why we are completing everything this week and, and uh, we, we will be on target. Uh, so uh, back to the 70 plus and the school, we were planning to go with the 70 for the schools. Nevertheless, the province uh, pivoted and included 70 plus in the plan. And we were able to pivot within the weekend and start our clinics this week for 75 plus and uh, allow the schools to be in phase two after April or earlier if we receive a vaccine. And you can appreciate that uh, the ability to pivot is directly related to the large capacity we have to uh, to provide the vaccine. Um, any any question on the phase one and the rollout of vaccine before I go into the survey for opinion? Um, and please just speak up as I can't see the whole screen. So I had a question, Sue. Go ahead, Chris. So I know, uh, Doctor, some of our daycare workers have um, gotten the vaccine so far and um, very concerned about um, those workers getting that because of the um, how important it is to uh, working parents in our community. Are, are, are we tracking um, 
how many daycare workers have gotten it so far and, uh, and what the plan is? I know they're in phase two overall, but uh, just wondering. Through your Perhaps. hand, Chair, that, that is an excellent question. And when I spoke about the schools uh, in, in my mind, in the categories, we have childcare included with them. If you remember, um, Mayor, we spoke about it. You raised the point, uh, rightly so, that they are uh, a sector with high risk of transmission. And uh, I mentioned that uh, they are with the schools in phase two, April uh, 1st. And, and in two days from that discussion, about eight days ago, there was the um, you know, information about larger shipments for Grey Bruce, uh, five to 8,000 uh, doses. So we immediately included them in the plans with school childcare and uh, school um, uh, groups. And, and th there is a reason for, for including them. One is the higher risk of transmission in, it, in this group. And the second one is the practicality because we, we were able to get lists quickly from them. Nevertheless, with the pivot to 70 plus, uh, although there is higher risk for schools and child care to acquire the disease, there is higher risk of death for the 75 plus, and that's a provincial direction too, so we, we pivoted back. Nevertheless, they are on the list. As soon as we receive larger amount of vaccine, yeah. they would qualify for it. Okay, that's great. Uh, well, thank you for that, and I did notice our, in our total number of vaccines, we, we do seem to be um, tracking as a percentage of vaccinated uh, above the uh, provincial average. So that's a great, uh, great track record at the health unit. Uh, Nick Saunders, please go ahead. Uh, thank you. I, I just have a couple of questions um, that I've received from not actually, they're not even First Nations folks. They just know that they just know me. And um, they've been asking, when do we see the community living settings, uh, those folks that are living alone, but they're still at high risk, when do we see them getting done? And then my other question is about herd immunity. Because we live in the area that we live in, is herd immunity still going to be achievable when the influx of tourism starts for the summer and we have all the cottagers and campers coming up? because that is fast approaching upon us. Thank you. Through you, Madam Chair, two excellent points. The community setting is in phase two and, and uh, it is based on the provincial direction and the ethical framework. Uh, it's worth mentioning disability, physical disability is not uh, on its own. It's, it's not a uh, higher a predisposing factor for higher uh, or, or severe disease from COVID. If there are other conditions like heart disease and other, it would be. Nevertheless, they are uh, in phase two, uh, scheduled to be April 1st. And if we can receive vaccines earlier, again, we can roll as soon as we can. The second question is, is definitely a question for uh, our planning table for the past uh, while. And, and uh, looking at the logistics of it, our area is... Uh, 100, around 180,000 people uh, in the winter. And in the summer, we received 2.3, my understanding from the last uh, census or survey I've seen, 2.3 million people over the summer months. So more or less our, our population can double or triple depending on, on a season in different times. And uh, uh, that, that is definitely a logistical challenge. Uh, knowing that if people came over as a, uh, secondary resident, their own resident, their, uh, or, or visitors, they can still qualify for the vaccine based on that criteria. And, and that's something we're working um, with, with raising with the province, uh, how we can address it. Um, at this point, everybody can book anywhere. However, if there's more demand on the vaccine and the shipments we have, we can definitely pivot to a different model. Okay, um, any other questions or comments before Dr. Era continues? Uh, Anne, uh, Sue. Yes. Uh, I have been, uh, I'm glad Nick mentioned that because I have been very concerned about our community livings. There's all sorts of living arrangements. Uh, I can speak to King Carden community living and I know Chris can speak to Brockton. But some of the settings, it, it's, it's almost like a long-term care setting, you know, as far as uh, the facility. 
And then others, of course, are in their own apartment, etc. But I'm part particularly concerned, and it has been such a trying time living in such close quarters. Um, I, I've received that feedback. And uh, I, I really hope that they are a priority um, it just as soon as possible because it has been a very, very long year for our King Carden community living uh, for some of the residential settings. Madam Chair, if I may add on that subject, uh, they are definitely priority. And when I speak about phase two, it is in, in effect at this point. We actually provided the, th the three largest uh, community setting, but not all community setting. We provided the vaccine uh, already. It, and, and um, you know, as the, the, again, the, the only limitation or the main limitation we have is the amount of vaccine that, uh, that we have. And it is allocated provincially and there was responsiveness to, uh, to, to ensure that there is fair distribution and we can meet phase, uh, phase one by the end of March or before. But again, there is not that amount of vaccine that can allow us to finish phase two within, uh, within March. We have to wait for that vaccine to arrive and go through it through April, hopefully earlier than the provincial plan. Okay, um, Dr. Era, please continue. Thank you, Madam Chair. So this is a, a survey report uh, that we conducted through um, a, a party, a third party that does phone calls and uh, we have the results here. It's small print, but I'm gonna go through the slide set which reflect these main results. So the, the demographic of the survey, I wonder if we can, is it large enough for the group? Mm -hmm. If you can move that, thank you. Yeah. So it's about 400 respondents, which is a very decent number. If you go with any survey over 500, 600 or 1,000, there is a risk of finding significance when there isn't just because of the sheer numbers. And if you go with the smaller survey numbers under 30, or under, in this case, uh, under 50, it might really not reflect the reality out there. So this is a reassuring number. And there are certain uh, criteria for inclusion. If uh, the phone caller uh, or the, the person who answers the phone in Grey Bruce says, I work or uh, I'm affiliated with Grey Bruce Healthy Net, they will be excluded immediately. And there are other parameters uh, to adjust for income for age. And those are slides at the end of the presentation, just uh, more or less quality variables to ensure the results represent Grey Bruce population. So perceived risk of COVID, we ask people uh, if, if they're concerned about COVID and, and uh, it, it is uh, definitely, uh, and the number of people who are infected 6% do not know or at least very small and not infected is a majority. And one in 20 respondents have have been infected with COVID or have had a family member infected. And we realized that employment is, uh, is more or less a protective factor uh, in, in the results and exposure or in affiliation with a family member or a, a friend that had the disease. Uh, so high risk groups, um, about 40% uh, said uh, I am high risk and uh, about 25% uh, said I live with somebody high risk and this is very concerning for me. Um, overall, seven out of 10 respondents expressed their concern. There are 17% who said I'm not very worried. However, most people are worried for different reasons there. Uh, following uh, guidance, and this is something that's uh, you know, I, I mentioned in, in our meetings with the municipalities or with the two counties about the compliance from the public. We don't usually put all this data out there just because interpretation of it is, is uh, uh, could be not easy. Sorry. Would I be able to have a cursor up, up there? No. Uh, the, the red spots on a, on a file would show the people who are not following guidance, whether wearing a mask, whether washing hands, uh, keeping distance, 
uh, the the red it's it's a, like less than five percent in every category. Most people are following the direction the six percent all the time. The sorry the not six percent sorry the blue color uh, all the time, and the yellow color is uh, uh, sometimes or, or around that. So you would see compliance in the public is, for example, for the first one, wearing a mask is eighty-four uh, percent. Sorry, is, is there something uh, with the technology? No, I'm just wondering if you want me to... Um... Oh, point to it. Yeah. I will, I, will, I will try to cover it with my voice. Thank you. Don't worry about it. Uh, hand washing regularly, again, ensuring children hand wash. This is, this is as good as it gets. For any public health intervention, if we get 50% of the public, 60% are in good standing. In Grey Bruce, we do have over 85%. And again, you can look at the yellow part and put a line in the middle and say half of these people would, would do it more often. The other half would be on the other side. So you would look at 80, 90% for, for uh, most of these variables. Uh, out of home behavior. So travel outside of Grey Bruce, attend indoor places. And uh, again, most people would say they're following the recommendation. And, and that is uh, absolutely what we see from other sources of data, whether when I communicate with the chief of police and they mentioned that the number of uh, 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 tickets over the summer were minimal or education at some, some junctures, wherever there is uh, um, COVID fatigue or whenever uh, the, the weather was better during the summer, you would see more people uh, uh, departing from, from the recommendation, but all in all, uh, those results are, are excellent. Uh, performance managing COVID. So the trust in the health unit performing managing COVID. And this data was, was collected in, in January uh, over a period of time. Uh, so 60%, 66%, I would say we provide clear info. Uh, we provide up-to-date information. Uh, that's the blue part. The yellow part they will say uh, somewhat agree. So again, they're not saying not. You would see the, the red and uh, the, the smaller percentage at the very end who say no, it's a very, very small uh, amount and it will never be zero, but having less than 10% is, is excellent. Um, and, and that's again, the work, if I wanna attribute it, I look at the eight pillars for our response. One is the health unit protocols and communication. And then again, talk about that uh, plenty. Uh, the local political commitment to health when every uh, mayor, every council, every political leader is echoing the health unit recommendation and we're all on the same page. Again, constituents uh, look up to the leader and, and they emulate. Uh, the local media in general, uh, since the pandemic, I would say, started, uh, they have been, in the exception of two or three incidents, uh, being very effective in providing the information in timely way to the public for, for each person to make informed decision, protect themselves, their family, and, and the community. And these numbers would reflect, this slide would reflect that collective effort. There are two other pillars, whether it's uh, the community um, the organizations or the healthcare system and the public itself being informed. Uh, so this is this is a beautiful graph. Uh, like if I see this in any intervention in public health, I would think this is a great success. If I see it in the middle of a pandemic after 12 months of, of uh, fatigue from COVID, uh, th this is quite the accomplishment for everybody in great groups. And, and uh, I might come back to this slide after. Uh, vaccines and COVID-19 uh, vaccine readiness. So 80% uh, said that it is necessary to prevent disease and 15% would say somewhat agree, but you know, that, that's the majority. That's uh, over 90% saying this is the way to go. Effectiveness uh, vaccine are effective. Again, very similar percentage if you add the blue and the yellow. Uh, the anti-vaxxers is first... Uh, um, line that, that red uh, sliver, the small amount, and, and usually it is one or two percent who, who are anti vaxxers. Nevertheless, on social media, they have quite the presence. Uh, sorry, here we go. 
Likelihood of getting the vaccine, uh, you, would, you would see, the majority would say definitely. And some people would say probable, but you know, the, the number of people who would say no, it's uh, uh, not that 6% in, in this part of uh, the survey. And that's, I, I should have mentioned up top of the slide, there is the question that was asked. And so sometimes there is uh, certain things that uh, can uh, be interpreted in this data and in qualitative research, if we go back to ask these people. As you likely know, vaccines have been developed to protect against COVID-19. I'm reading the question. Uh, once COVID-19 vaccine is rolled out in Ontario, would, would, you, uh, would you say you? And, and the answer is uh, probably or, or not, or definitely not. Um, again, there is certain uh, percentage there uh, or, or certain margin of error for these numbers, but the majority, the extreme majority would say yes. And this is our, uh, our, our ticket for, uh, for herd immunity. Like we don't, most, most jurisdiction would have to struggle with communication down the road in phase two and the phase two and three. That's where it's gonna come to actually encourage people to get the vaccine. I don't think need to, to, have to say a word. It's already from January, two weeks or two, a few weeks after approval of the vaccine, people are already informed. And we start with communication about vaccine and work on it earlier. And that's really all of it feeds into that trust uh, in, in the approach. Reasons for getting the vaccine. Uh, most people would say, I wanna protect myself, protect my family, to protect the community. That's uh, the bulk of the, the group. There are other different reasons. And uh, reasons for not getting the vaccine. Again, uh, some people would say it was rushed. So you can appreciate that 40% of the people, and that is a small percentage, uh, the, around 15% of the uh, survey, so for 40% of 15%, that's around 7% would say um, it, it was rushed. So uh, it, with the application or the use administration of the vaccine for a few months and more data, this, this group might be smaller and smaller. Nevertheless, to start with, we have plenty. So profile of respondents, those are the, the variables that ensure uh, the sample is representative. And you can see it's really representative uh, to different income uh, levels. And uh, there is some more representation in the older group uh, to respond to the survey. And that's expected. Uh, younger people might be uh, at work most of the time, might not be able to answer or might not be interested. Nevertheless, these are just slides to ensure the quality of the data. Um, I'm gonna, so that's the end of the presentation. I'm just gonna go to that slide uh, for the management of the pandemic. And I'll stop there, Madam Chair and, and Council, if you have any question before I make a couple of comments on this one. Thank you, Dr. Era, Brian Millen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Dr. Era, the, uh, the survey was taken uh, mid-January uh, before the uproar over the AstraZeneca uh, vaccine and the perceptions around that, would you expect that to skew this significantly or not? Uh, no. If the survey was done now? Uh, I would expect it uh, to have some effect, but not major in any way. Okay, thank you. Okay, further questions before we move on? Yes, please, through you, Madam Chair. Go ahead, um, Madam Chair. Thank you. I, I noticed uh, the line Indigenous responders, respondents are less positive about some aspects. And then further, uh, the only aspect that I'm seeing flagged are, um, is vaccine hesitancy. Um, so first question around that, is that the only, the only aspect or was there something else that I, that I missed in my reading? Um, and in this presentation, and then I have a further question after that. So I, I can look in the background of the, the presentation or the data that came in uh, uh, to see if there are any other aspects. I haven't seen any other one, but as you know, the, the history uh, that, that uh, unfortunately happened really does not build trust with the establishment or the Western uh, establishment or the Western medicine. And, and it is expected to see indigenous uh, community less uh, uh, receptive to 
any intervention from that point of view, rightly so, I would say. And that's why the, you can see in the, in the framework, ethical framework in the province, uh, the, the provision of vaccine should be completely open to all adults uh, and without any uh, priority, all, all the communities priority partially for this reason. There was other mention in one slide earlier on about uh, um, the ability of people to follow the, uh, the public health recommendation in keeping distance. And th that's the other spot where indigenous communities uh, response was uh, less favorable than, than uh, the other communities. And that's directly related to many factors that um, uh, related to whether it's uh, income or related to crowding. And uh, so there are uh, built environment factors for the organization that, that uh, um, uh, exists in different communities comparing to the uh, indigenous community where distancing is, is uh, possible in these facilities, but not in facilities in the First Nation. So it's not really based on attitude or behavior, rather on uh, the, the ability or, or the resources available. And all of this really right, rightly goes to the provincial uh, framework saying uh, uh, the, the indigenous community absolutely uh, needs the vaccine and uh, will, will be provided the vaccine if they wish to have it. Thank you for that uh, thorough response, Dr. Arara. Um, two more things, if I may, Madam Chair. Um, one, to ask, do we have, uh, or is there being designed any particular communication strategy um, to attempt to, to rebuild or, or to build from scratch the trust between the health unit and members of the First Nation, as Dr. Aras pointed out, very understandable lack of trust and hesitancy. Um, and the second uh, little broader question, I noticed that um, in the table, there are only 7% of what are what I would call anti-vaxxers, you know, 7% were, were listed as those that are against vaccinations generally. So the others, any hesitancy, um, do we, are we, are we working on any communication strategy for the specific issues that are uh, barriers to full involvement by people who are hesitant, are, uh, other than that 7% of those that aren't gonna have it that are the true, no, I'm not ever gonna get a vaccination, don't believe in them. The others, uh, we can sway them possibly with, with a, a, a good communication strategy. So to recap, my, my question is twofold. One is about a broad strategy for those that, are, that, that need convincing that are not true anti-vaxxers. And the other is to do with specifically um, a communication strategy designed to help rebuild or perhaps build trust between members of First Nations and the health unit board. Thank you. Thank you through you, Madam Chair. Uh, so I'll start with the second point, the broad strategy for um, uh, vaccine readiness. And, and uh, it, it is well, well documented evidence about different variables and factors that come into the decision for different individuals. It's really not one reason. It, it sometimes is a combination of uh, few, whether it's faith, whether it's uh, age, whether it's uh, culture, religion, uh, you name it. Uh, the, the most appropriate uh, time to deploy these strategies are later in, in phase two, in phase three. Uh, right now, we, we have the highest priority people, almost everybody wants it, uh, the, the 80 plus um, want the vaccine, and we know there is a limited amount of it, and so our major role is to roll it out as soon as we can. And as we go, uh, two things will happen, one automatically, more vaccines have been used and no side effects or no major uh, worries that people have uh, about the vaccine will materialize. And that really can, is gonna help many people make that decision. And to start with, many people would say, uh, I can take the vaccine, but not now. And that's uh, the category you're targeting in the question there. Uh, the second part that's gonna happen automatically with increased numbers. The second part, yes, we, we do have communication and it's not, you know, public health. Craybrook's health unit uh, type of communication. It is public health as a specialty. And we do this on annual basis. There's education sessions to K 
parents uh, for different vaccines uh, when they uh, decide that their kids need to be, to be opted out of the program. And there are communication that's related to the flu uh, vaccine. And, and it's a very similar structure, um, whether it's strategy or, or tactics in, in deploying information in a timely fashion. Uh, those will come later. Uh, the uh, first uh, question, it is a key question in the in the, in the strategy for the health unit. And uh, I believe in, in uh, the, 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 there are many words can be used there. It is something that should have uh, been done for many years. And I know many people try to uh, start a new page, uh, but there should be readiness in the system. There should be readiness in the public. And I see after re reconciliation report a few years ago, uh, all the all the uh, plan to go forward is already outlined there, and I do believe uh, we have the commitment from myself and my team and from the board uh, to to uh, be as collaborative, open, and, and uh, a true a true partnership. And uh, it it is uh, it is a pandemic that played certain role. Emergencies and and catastrophes tend to have that inherent. Uh, nature to them that they bring people together in and uh, I do believe I, I wouldn't I don't want to speak for um, uh, Councillor Sanders uh, and, and I would uh, welcome his input here I do believe we really uh, walked many miles over the past year in, in this direction um, to say the least okay Thank you. And I don't see uh, Nick Saunders at this point. Um, Madam Chair, I, I received a, a message when, when uh, we were just talking uh, that uh, he wishes to view a video. If I got the message right, uh, Aaron? Yeah. I, I'm here. I just, I, I got, I got off the, uh, off the link. So I'm trying to get back onto the link. Oh, okay. Um, Nick, did you want to comment? or not? I, I think that uh, Dr. Ayer has summed this up very well. Um, in the past year, I, I have to say that the yardstick has been moved quite far in responses from the Great Bruce Health Unit when it comes to the COVID vaccine, um, talking about the COVID pandemic, and even going as far as when we helped to initiate uh, the meeting set up for all the others, uh, everybody else in the mayors and CAOs um, talking about COVID, vac um, COVID fatigue and post-COVID and looking at how that's going to affect even ourselves as, as frontline workers, uh, as counselors, mayors, wardens, fire departments. What is the post-traumatic stress going to be on us and on our mental well-being? Um, and we're not just fighting one pandemic at, actually at this time. We're all fighting the pandemic of the opioid crisis as well. And I think that together um, with the right people in the room, we're going to be able to accomplish a lot of things that uh, other health units and other provinces may be able to consider and uh, looking at. And I did send a, I'm hoping that the YouTube went through to Aaron. Um, I think that this presentation that was provided to Dr. Aaron, I wanted to include others, but with social distancing and that going on, we had to maintain that. But we were able to get a video and I apologize that I did not speak in this video. I had been up for 38 hours and I will let the video speak to itself uh, with the elders and the chief that is, and Dr. Era that are in the video. Um, and that's all I'll say, thanks. Thank you for that, Nick. Uh, any other comments? Sorry, it, it, it's Aaron, if I can just, uh, I, Nick, I didn't get a link from you. Is it possible for you to resend it to me? I don't have the link to the to the video yet. I don't know if you're able to get on YouTube, Aaron, and yeah. type in Dr. Dr. Arab uh, receives eagle feather. Okay.
Okay, bear with me one moment. I think I've got it here. Okay. My name is Vernon Root, and I am from the Saugeen First Nation, and I'm recognized as an elder for the Joint Council of the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation. I'm Ogama Drake Najwan, Chippewa Maywash, Unceded First Nation. Miigwech. I'm Dr. Ian Era, the Medical Officer of Health for Gray Bruce. I'm honored to be here. Thank you. Councilor Nick Saunders from the Chippewa and Maywash. Okay, we're here today to uh, <clears throat> give recognition to the doctor for the work that he's been performing for us in our community uh, during this uh, pandemic uh, times that we're in. We value the, uh, the approach to having the virus encountered and to make sure that uh, our people are safe. So the the doctor's uh, method of helping us, we have appreciated that, and it is with great honor today that I'm able to present in our way, our way of recognition for the work that's being done to help save our people from any future viruses that might be around. So doctor, with this, uh, we give, uh, you the recognition and offer you the feather in terms of our honoring yourself for the work that you've been doing and with this we give you a feather thank you thank you I am I am honored and speechless and uh, it, it has been a privilege to to work with you to serve with you and to serve the community and uh, it uh, it, it just the results that we had in the community, the low number of counts really speaks to, to the success of all the uh, parties and the partners around the table and the strong leadership from the chief and, and uh, the council. Thank you. I'm honored. So as we move on, I as chief will be uh, introducing a few other people to come in and join us. A year ago today, I've been reminded this community announced a state of emergency one year ago today. Really not what we're getting into or how long we'd be into that state of emergency. One of the first things we, uh, we did was we uh, arranged to have a, a committee put together made up of uh, people who made up the health team the fire department, the police, social services. Uh, I probably am, am going to miss one or two, but it included communications, who is bringing us this event this afternoon. So this committee met for the year, every Wednesday. And what they did was they discussed, debated, came up with recommendations. The recommendations then went to chief and council and we worked on these recommendations to uh, make our community as safe as possible. I'd like to say one of these recommendations was we started having our food bank available to the community twice a week. We started organizing our fishermen to uh, harvest fish, which we donated to friendship centers and uh, and others in the surrounding areas to make sure that our off-reserve membership and other indigenous people were gifted with uh, uh, the harvest of, of 
fish. So much has happened, so many suggestions, which we followed up on. We started monitoring people coming into the community. Not to make anyone's life difficult, but to try and provide as much protection as possible. There's so many things I can say that we opted to do over the year to make our community as safe as possible. We were extremely worried about our elderly and we uh, those with compromised issues of health. And today as I stand here, it's uh, hard not to get a bit emotional because we managed to do the one year with this pandemic upon us and really only had two positive cases reveal themselves in the community, which we addressed in a very fast order. I've spoken to the elders since the vaccine has become available and they're elated. They're so pleased with the recommendations from the community and they realize the sacrifices that we as a community managed to go through to make sure that we stayed safe and healthy. And I can't thank the doctor, Councillor Saunders, who has been a rock in the issue of providing uh, services for the past year. The health unit, communications, social services, the food bank, the monitors. This, a year later, we, we deserve to acknowledge and uh, celebrate. And uh, this is early, we're doing a, we're honoring the doctor today. But I can guarantee you when we're at the light at the end of the tunnel, when we're there, we will make sure that this community has a very, very large, long-awaited community celebration. Be with you. Yes, very well done. Um, Nick, I don't know if you can see everyone's clapping on the screen. Quite an honor for Dr. Era and an honor that we are able, we were able to view it during this meeting. Thank you, Nick. No, I, I uh, Chair, I'd like to say thank you to Dr. Era and to all the health unit. Um, they, they have gone above and beyond for all of our communities and, and it's not just our, it's not just the First Nations that are going through this. It's all of us as municipalities, um, friends and neighbors, loved ones, family, we're all going through this. And it's at times like this where maybe in the past things haven't been done properly, but this is where proper foundations get to be built and partnerships that are truthful and meaningful start to reconcile and we can start to become as one and as whole together. Um, and I, and I, I just, I have to thank Dr. Ayer again tremendously for the efforts that he's put forward to ensuring that we are kept safe. And, and I know that we don't all do it alone. We do it with our communities backing us, um, even though they may not always agree with us. Thank you. Well said, Nick. Madam Chair, if I may just add there a couple of minutes, a uh, couple of uh, words. Um, it, it, it has been uh, definitely one of the, um, I'm speechless again. Uh, that, that, that part that you've seen is, is part of a bigger ceremony and uh, I've never been speechless in a public setting. Uh, it's the easiest thing I can do and I found myself uh, trembling like a, uh, a leaf in the wind. Absolutely, the the, the 
in my training in Northern Ontario uh, Medical School um, at NOSM, we have exposure to the uh, traditional uh, medicine and the traditional, uh, the First Nation tradition. Um, and and uh, uh, receiving that level of honor, this is something that people work for entire life and never get. So I, I know that I did not do it on my own. I was supported by the board yourself in every juncture and, and people uh, around the table know uh, the, the challenges that we received, we, we faced. And, and most of these challenges that our governance level is not uh, Ian uh, that can uh, overcome it. It was the board support, the, the letters that were written, the, the uh, stance that was taken, that would allow us to actually the room for myself and my team to perform and deliver and working with the community to receive that honor, that, that uh, honor is definitely for all of us, for the board as well. And, and I will, as I mentioned to the chief, I will, um, I will definitely hold it in, a, um, in my home, in a place of honor uh, my entire life. There's nothing higher than that, that uh, honor uh, in that juncture. Thank you. I'm still, again, speechless there, but uh, I'm gonna get used to it, I guess, being speechless. Okay, thanks, Dr. Ira. Um, Helen Clare. Thank you, Madam Chair. That was an incredibly moving um, ceremony to watch, to be able to participate even virtually. Uh, Nick's comments also at its conclusion speak to the la larger concept of community that we, we strive for. Um, and public health, of course, speaks to that. The, the, what we just all witnessed is illustrative and, and exemplary of the incredible work that has been done under the guidance and leadership of Dr. Ara. And I, I just wanted to, uh, to make that statement. Yes, we're all a team. Yes, we're all doing our, our part. Yes, we're all part of larger communities. But the common, the center of that wheel is Dr. Ara. And it just seemed like a wonderful opportunity after watching that great honor that was just bestowed upon him by the First Nation community. It just seemed like a perfect opportunity to underscore how very lucky we are to have him here with us leading the charge in Grey Bruce. Thank you. Further comments? Okay, um, Dr. Era, is your update complete? Um, did we answer the questions about availability of um, vaccine and was there herd immunity? Was that a question too? No, Madam Chair, I wanted to go back to that slide about uh, the trust and the, the response to the health unit, if I may. Uh, if there are other questions, I'm open to answer too. Okay. So Madam Chair, this, this data is from January and it really reflects the entire year. And we, we had uh, uh, that, that trust that's built on the different pillars of response and the fact that uh, public health has been transparent, has been providing the information in timely fashion. Um, it, around January, I received few concerning, uh, at the time they were not as concerning, it's just an opinion uh, of, of one counselor, only one counselor in, in Grey Bruce. And uh, um, it's, it's questioning the, the, the process and, and the vaccine rollout in, in certain aspects. And I, uh, in, as, as always, I responded immediately, provided all the information. Uh, certain questions were raised, but recently I can see that uh, these questions are being made public and, in, and then they don't seem to reflect the fact that they were already answered and answered completely. And, and uh, more, uh, we provide answers and opportunity to, to provide uh, the, the full picture that we already have on our website on the situation report, the data we provide, the number of vaccines administered on daily basis, not just weekly. Um, the, the more it seems to be uh, not sufficient and something else needs to be done. Uh, so um, I, am, I am deeply concerned at this point that uh, the, the any, any communication or effort to undermine the response, the health unit response uh, would affect and might affect, potentially affect the 
the trust that we're building. And those uh, slides that we reviewed have the trust in the response from the health unit, has the trust in the vaccine process, in, in, in the entire response and the compliance for public health. So any, any factor that would actually lower that trust in any of these slides would potentially cause uh, negative effect on the health of uh, people in Grey Bruce. And, and uh, as you know, Madam Chair, uh, we discussed this yourself and myself, and I am, uh, it, we both agreed that we need to address this in one way or the other directly uh, and openly as always. Uh, I, I wonder if, uh, if, if you would have any comments there or if uh, the, the group would comment on this. Um, I can uh, share with the group that yes, Dr. Aaron and I discussed this and uh, we would like to attend this council meeting and um, set the facts straight, get the information out there and um, just present the information. Any other comments, Brian? Madam Chair, yes. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say that that I would certainly uh, like to see the board give direction to both the chair and Dr. Ira to come to our city council meeting and nip this at the bud. I, I think it needs to be addressed, and uh, and and I I hope that the rest of the board will will support in in that uh, direction. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Brian Millen. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I agree wholeheartedly with uh, with with uh, Mr. O'Leary. Um, although I would say uh, that I, I'm not sure direction needs to be given. Uh, I think the board has made it clear that Dr. Era has a mandate to to uh, certainly deal with uh, with the pandemic and any issues that arise therefrom. And I would encourage both yourself, Madam Chair, and Dr. Era to do what needs to be done. Uh, and if you think uh, approaching, uh, I take it its own sound council to, uh, to help further uh, the uh, trust and the perception of the management of the pandemic in Grey Bruce, have at it. Uh, I have absolutely no concerns with that at all. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Anything further? I think uh, we're all on the same page here, so. And at this point, um, Aaron, can you uh, stop sharing the screen? Yes. Um, as, as we're um, talking about the uh, update, a few comments I would like to make. Um, we do have some guests viewing our meeting today and this meeting is being recorded. So I'm sure people are gonna watch it later. So I wanna talk about the recently published Sunshine List as it has raised some questions. It is important to note that this is a listing of public sector employees who earned $100,000 or higher, and that list does not reflect any comparators. In fact, it is just a list. Dr. Era is paid a salary and paid for his overtime, and he has literally worked every day since the first COVID-19 cases were identified in Grey Bruce in March, 2020. His salary is set by the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care. I also wanna share that there's been a miscommunication with one of my quotes. And uh, to clarify, throughout all of 2020 and to date, we have not had an Associate Medical Officer of Health. There are certain legislated responsibilities and authority that can only be performed by a Medical Officer of Health or a designated associate appointed by the minister. These responsibilities cannot be performed by a physician consultant. A physician consultant does not have that legislative authority to fulfill the medical officer of health on call requirement as each health unit must have a medical officer of health on call at all times, 24 hours a day. As such, there is no one for whom Dr. Era could have passed over the legislative responsibilities in the past year. We have had physician consultants 
from time to time. In fact, Dr. Lena Lee was in a supporting role until the end of July, but did not fulfill the MOH on-call requirements. We also had Dr. Cole who followed, with, followed her with a part-time supporting role from the end of September to November, one or two days a week, and again, did not fulfill the medical officer of health on-call requirements. A new full-time physician con consultant was hired in February 2021, and that is Dr. Zayed, who was introduced today. Again, welcome, Dr. Zayed. So I just wanted to share that with everyone. And Dr. Era, if you want to add further comments, I know Dr. Lee was uh, um, a great addition to the team, and uh, it's unfortunate that she has moved on, but uh, maybe you would like to speak to that, Dr. Era. Uh, certainly, it has been a great, a great privilege to work with Dr. Lee. She uh, nicely fulfilled her role as physician consultant in the first wave and has contributed tremendously and has been and, and still remains uh, uh, part of the, the uh, history of that response. And, and uh, we, we have all the appreciation for her work. Uh, her, her contract was one year and uh, she, she decided that uh, uh, working in Toronto Public Health is, uh, as a physician consultant, is a better option for whatever reason it is. And, and uh, I, I absolutely support uh, uh, her, her uh, performance. And, and uh, we remain colleagues and friends. And uh, uh, Dr. Cole, as well, he has been working one or two days uh, per week. He started one day per week, but later two days per week. Uh, nevertheless, as, as the chair mentioned, uh, he's not on call. And uh, we, we are definitely lucky to have Dr. Zayed uh, join our team. And I, I wanted to mention this a bit earlier at the start. Dr. Zayed has wealth of, of uh, knowledge and expertise. She worked with World Health Organization at the highest caliber. Her work in Northern Saskatchewan would uh, probably um, remain mentioned for years to come. So we were lucky to have her here and, and all these um, colleagues have contributed to, in, in many ways to their response. Thank you, Dr. Era. Are there any questions or comments? Okay, thank you. So Dr. Era, continuing on the standing item, the public health modernization, is there any update with that? Uh, no update at this point, uh, Madam Chair, that uh, item remains dormant uh, probably until the end of the uh, pandemic where the consultation will presume. Thank you. And the opioid situation, any updates? We, we remain uh, maintaining the core program functions such as the needle exchange, naloxone opiate, uh, and the opiate working group. And uh, it, it, since the last update, uh, probably the only sad uh, update that uh, anecdotally, we have seven fatalities since the start of the year. And, and uh, again, uh, in our minutes that were reviewed today from last meeting, there was uh, a direction from the board to uh, myself and the staff to draft our resolution for the Alpha Annual General Meeting, which is the most significant meeting for public health in Ontario, uh, to uh, um, highlight the need to mobilize our efforts from COVID-19 when the pandemic is over to uh, do the same good work in addressing the opioid crisis. Thank you. Any questions for Dr. Era? Um, Al Barfoot. Thanks, Madam Chair. Just going back to my question that I raised earlier, and I, I think Dr. Era has has answered it, but I I think it needs to uh, to be resounded again. I, I think we are then receiving in Gray Bruce, we are receiving the amount of vaccines proportionately than what the other health units are, are receiving within Ontario. Is that a fair statement, Dr. Era? That's a very fair statement. And uh, we can add to it, uh, uh, Sir Barfoot, uh, our our numbers as percentage of the population that uh, received the first dose is a bit above average uh, provincial. Okay, thank you. Okay, further comments, questions? 
All right, I need a mover and seconder to receive the Medical Officer of Health updates as presented. And I'll take uh, Brian O'Leary and Helen Claire Tingling. All in favor? That is carried, thank you. Item eight, 8.1 is the financial report for January, 2021. Uh, is this Christy or Matt or both? That is Matt, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, you have a financial statement uh, along with some uh, commentary uh, for a comparator's sake, uh, you have January of uh, 2020 uh, that uh, reviews uh, how we look year over year. Uh, we, are, we continue to expend money on salaries and wages uh, beyond what I say is our previous norm. Uh, completely uh, as we start to roll out both the continue the case and contact management and uh, starting to uh, build up for the uh, for the vaccine rollout. So uh, this is January, and uh, so that's just the beginning of that. And you can continue to see the uh, the time starting to uh, to go up. And I would expect that uh, into the near future as we continue to do both the uh, case and contact management and the vaccine rollout. Any questions? Okay, open the questions. I don't see any, Matt. So I need a mover and seconder to receive the January financials as presented. Uh, Ann Edie and Chris Peabody, all in favor? That is carried, thank you. Moving on, item 8.2, this is BDO planning report to the audit committee. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. That's uh, also for, uh, for myself. Uh, this is uh, the normal annual uh, communication that we have with our auditors. Uh, they think of it as to the audit committee and that's so the audit committee is actually embedded within the, uh, the board itself. So it, they are one in the same. Uh, and, and this is being presented as information to the board so that they get a, an understanding. And if there's questions, they can clearly uh, raise them and I welcome them. Uh, and also to uh, comment about uh, service costs. Uh, there is a uh, $750 uh, increase year over year, uh, but that follows a year of no increase. Uh, this equals roughly a one and a half percent over those two years, not an unreasonable number. Uh, this is also in the, the second year of a three-year contract with uh, BDO. Uh, open to questions. Thank you, Matt. Uh, Brian Millen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Matt, when you say it's the second year of a three-year contract, uh, did we go to the market th two years ago or did we just renew the contract? I don't recall. There, there was no, there, uh, we've never, uh, to my knowledge, we've never gone for an RFP to, uh, to the market for uh, any of our accounting services. Uh, and until uh, my uh, tenure here, uh, it was always assumed that whatever the auditor was for the largest county would be our auditor. Uh, over the, uh, the ensuing year, uh, it was determined that uh, as we were approaching uh, the potential for uh, changes to the, the public health system that we would not disturb our uh, financial audit uh, process, uh, we engaged for a further renewal of the three year. And it's been a rolling three year contract with them for some time. Thanks so, I, it, it, and the, the increase that was uh, it, it from, I'll say, first set of con well, the contract just prior to my tenure uh, to this contract has, has been in the, uh, the one to one and a half uh, percent range. So, there's, there's nothing dramatic. Thank you. And, Madam Chair, to be clear, I, I'm not concerned about the job or the quality of the work that BDO does, uh, or even the price for that matter, although I wouldn't know unless we went to the market. But uh, I can tell you that I, in the year's time when the can contract comes up, I will be seeking that uh, we go to the market. Thank you. Thank you. Helen Clare. Thank you. Just a question. I've not ever seen this before. Why is the letter to the board of directors not personally signed uh, on behalf of um, BDO Canada? It's just just BDO Canada. Who who is who is signing on behalf of? It's just strikes me as an odd thing. 
Thank you, Matt. Yeah, this is a, uh, it, it, I appreciate the question actually. Uh, the, it's a planning document versus a report. Uh, so this is not the final. This is uh, a, I'll say a precursor. So there, there's no actual uh, signatory aspect I would expect from BDO at this point. I think it's just them saying, here's what we're about to engage in. The only signatory part uh, would have been in regards to uh, any services uh, that they may provide in addition to, and there were none. Uh, so at this moment, it's really information that they're presenting uh, through me to you or directly to you, but it's just information. If there's if the specific report will be provided to you uh, in either the, the next or the following board meeting when the financial statement is uh, in its final draft, uh, then it gets re re reported to this board uh, for review and acceptance. Once that has happened, then uh, you will clearly have a, a stated signed report from the auditors. Does that help that I answer the question? Madam Chair? Yes, yes. Dr. Ure? Sorry, I, I interjection, interjecting here. Regardless of, of the reason for them not signing, I do believe uh, uh, Helen Clare's uh, request is, is very valid. We need a signature on the document. So we will request one uh, if, if that satisfies the, the question. And I have, uh, I have the same concern and I appreciate the sharp eyes. I didn't notice it. Thank you. Uh, Helen Clare, a response or? Yes, thank you. I, I just think any, any document, you know, we, we have signatures on behalf of uh, the Board of Health on our side. And I just think that if there is a line for a signature, it should be signed, not just, so that's my take. And, and I appreciate Dr. Arrow's comment to rectify that. Thank you. Thank you, anything further? Madam Chair, just in terms of uh, information for, for the benefit of the new members uh, this year on the board committee, uh, when uh, Matt is referencing that we did not go to uh, looking at, at the market uh, rates because of the potential changes in public health, he was referring to the uh, budget proposal April 11th, 2019, where uh, the proposal uh, indicated that the Board of Health will not exist after April 1st, 2020. And that's why it was a futile exercise to go change the, the uh, uh, process we have for, for uh, the year that was not anticipated. Nevertheless, uh, we, we are still the Board of Health and, and uh, that process continues as consultation. Thank you for that clarification. Al Barfoot. Thanks, Madam Chair. Just to support Matt's uh, comment and for the new members, there will be a full presentation by BDO at an upcoming meeting with the draft. And at that point, then the board um, can either um, change or like ask questions or whatever, but that there will be a draft that will come forward and has to be finalized by the board before it can uh, be fully adopted then. So, and I think through that report, I think Matt, you have that it will likely be in, in May, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. uh, through you, Madam Chair, yeah, that is correct. Okay, so I need a mover and seconder to receive this uh, information. So I'll take Al Barfoot and Selwyn Hicks. Thank you, all in favor. That is carried. All right, um, other, 9.0, other, 9.1, the purchasing policy um, procurement draft revisions. Dr. Era, is that? that that's, uh, that's for me. Sorry, that's with Matt again. We're gonna turn the camera. <laughs> uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So uh, it, at our uh, last board meeting, uh, we had uh, some really good comments and suggestions on a, the policy that was presented. Uh, so we took those uh, suggestions, uh, reviewed the, uh, the current uh, procurement policy, and uh, provide you with a, uh, a draft of an updated version of that that are attempting to address the concerns raised at uh, that juncture, uh, along with maybe a few other small uh, administrative changes as well. Uh, those are in red line or 
as I look at this now, it's actually some of it's in blue, uh, but they, all those changes will be marked as uh, either underlined, will be, will, will be underlined and will be in a color, whether they be red or blue. And these are presented for, uh, for your uh, uh, approval uh, or and obviously questions uh, as to whether they, they meet uh, the expectations, et cetera. Uh, we did do a uh, small change to the purpose uh, to uh, flag the, uh, the, the financial oversight to, uh, so it's tied into the purpose for the policy. Uh, we've given a specific definition to what written means uh, yeah, modernize it a little bit to make sure that we understand that it is uh, both physical and electronic. Uh, we go to uh, sections uh, F and G. Uh, we tie those specific sections to uh, limits that are set up in uh, under the policy section six. Uh, so, and, and this actually reflects our current process. Uh, irrespective that they weren't documented in the, uh, the policy or the procedure, uh, but we certainly want to be uh, fulsome. Uh, so what I wanted to make sure that those were included. And the last uh, part to this is the, if for uh, the scopes uh, set of uh, paragraphs was to link the uh, what is when we say the term of uh, the, the best benefit to the uh, health unit, what does that mean? Uh, so a sentence has been so slightly altered so that we actually uh, drive that at home. Uh, the point of uh, it, it's the most economical price that meets the user's uh, requirements for su suitability, quality, infectious control, safety delivery, and acceptability, accessibility, sorry. Uh, there are some other uh, small changes because there was the, 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 the valid, the indication of, of uh, written versus oral. Uh, so we wanted to be very uh, specific and we, we wrote in the written where it talks about documentation in three, four, and five, uh, remove the verbal in four. I believe those were the changes that we had uh, there was no other changes. So those are the changes that uh, management uh, considered uh, uh, following the, uh, uh, the last board meeting. And we bring it to you uh, forward for you for both comments, questions. Okay, thanks, Matt. So that policy with the changes will be sent out to the board? Am I the only one that didn't have it? Through you, uh, Sue, it was sent yesterday when I sent that revised link. Um, so it was included in the revised package. I have it on the screen now. I don't know if everybody can see it. Um, I would like to suggest that um, the board members, I don't know how many have had a chance to review it. I know I have not. So if it's okay, can we review it? Uh, for and, the next board meeting. Yeah, make our comments, suggestions, and then we'll look at it at the next board meeting. Just, Absolutely, it, Madam Chair, no, no issue whatsoever. Yeah, just not enough time in the day to <laughs> read a policy. <laughs> uh, Helen Clare. Thank you, yes, through you, Madam Chair. I did get a chance to go through it, so I just wanted to offer up one thing if it might uh, expedite next time. First, thank you so much for all the work done on this. Uh, many of the concerns that I raised last time, uh, it, it looks so much better as a document. Um, I did notice, um, for one, major equipment. So I just wondered if, if, uh, if, since we're gonna have a period of time now to look at this again, if the term major equipment might standard definition as well. Um, and I'll just leave that in your capable hands. Thanks again for all the work that you've put into this. It's a much better document. Okay, any other comments or questions? So we'll just uh, receive that so we can uh, review it and discuss at the next meeting. Let's move on to updating policies for employee recognition. Erin, are you gonna tell me that was in the updated policy or package too? <laughs> well, Madam Chair, that is verbal from myself. Just, uh, it's an item just uh, asking for direction or, or uh, permission to uh, review 
a couple of policies related to long-term award. Uh, the, the, and, and the second one is the a retirement uh, award uh, policy. So these two policies uh, are, are a bit uh, outdated from the uh, point of view that uh, the, the uh, a gift for somebody who spent 20 years uh, might not really reflect the, uh, the uh, appropriate price for a gift these days, whether it's $25 or $50. Uh, so for us to review that and uh, the, to, to actually merge the two policies similar to what my understanding of the county's policies are, uh, to, to have it more, uh, more reflective of uh, appropriate recognition to our staff when they spend that long uh, and reach the achievement of a retirement. Comments for Dr. Era? Um, Al, did you have your hand up? Yeah, I did. Actually, I, th yeah, I think that's well overdue. Um, I'm not sure when the last policy was uh, updated, Dr. Era, but uh, you're right. I think it needs to be uh, updated again. Thank you. Okay. So, Dr. Era, you said you're looking at it um, similar to what the county uh, policy is. is. Is that what I heard? Correct. Potentially, we'll review it and review the policy from the county and, and uh, bring it back to the board for decision. Sounds like a good plan. Okay. Um, any, nothing further. And we do not have an in-camera meeting. So there's only one item left on the agenda, and that is adjournment at 11.36. Sorry, Madam Chair, there is, there is an item uh, recognition of the managers who worked oh. in 2020. Sorry, in I'm <laughs> Yes. Okay, so, Erin? Yeah, so it looks like we have all the managers on. Do we want them to turn on their cameras and join or? Certainly, yeah. Uh, Madam Chair? Yes. Are you all right with the managers uh, joining us with their cameras on? Absolutely. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. So, Ma Madam Chair, uh, we, we looked at the work that had been done in 2020, and, and it's tremendous, and it's, uh, it, it, it would not even do it justice to recognize anybody through any length of time or words, but it, 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 would, uh, it would be very um, reasonable to just introduce the, the different roles that each manager have, have uh, done. In, and during the emergency, as you know, there's a lockdown and, and the, there is a reopening, then the school reopening, then the vaccine, and our managers uh, have been very, very effective uh, and uh, um, and flexible in a way that they can actually take different roles to ensure redundancy and to ensure uh, a backup in case one manager needed uh, a vacation, you would find one or two ready to, to be doing the role. And I will just turn it to uh, the directors, starting with uh, uh, Sarah, interim director, to uh, uh, recognize each of the managers who reported to you and to um, Susan Schuler as a second director as well. In, and it's worth mentioning that Susan uh, has uh, reached her retirement and uh, uh, with very mixed emotions. I've never been actually as emotional, happy for, for a colleague to achieve uh, that milestone at the same time being saddened for missing out on the company. And, and uh, we invited her, but uh, um, uh, she was not available for today. There will be a recognition for her retirement, which is totally separate from her recognition of work for 2020. And uh, because she's not here, Sarah, uh, as a colleague, will uh, speak uh, and recognize the managers that reported to Susan as well. Sure. Thank you, Dr. Era. So I just wanted to take a few minutes and thank the managers for responding to the pandemic, and I'll just do it one by one. So I'll start with Ian Reich. And Ian says he remembers leaving for March break uh, last year and as a nurse manager and coming back as manager of communications. So that's quite a shift in portfolio for Ian. So we really want to thank Ian for and his team, the communications team, for all of the great work that um, they've done in supporting the communications um, throughout this pandemic. And it's certainly ebbed and flowed, and he's had to be on call 
on weekends doing the situation report and we thank him for all of his um, hard work and dedication. Um, uh, next, we're going to acknowledge Andrew Barton and Andrew is the, played various roles throughout the pandemic. He uh, helped with planning as well as reopening, closing, reopening, closing many times, restaurants, pools, uh, personal service settings and such. So we want to uh, thank Andrew and Andrew is now joining us um, on the vaccine rollout and he's been instrumental in getting the community-based hubs and the hub model implemented. So thank you, Andrew. I next wanna acknowledge Andra Ashton. Andra joined our team in May, 2020 and took over the large portfolio of COVID-19 case and contact management. Andrew's mm -hmm. developed um, a team structure that's flexible and adaptable to respond to the ebbs and flows of COVID cases throughout Graham Bruce. So we thank Andra for her contributions. Next, I wanna thank um, Andrea Riley. Andrea worked with the school health team and local school health partners to develop the school health program, which is a new program, and along with the school reopening. Um, she also uh, was instrumental in managing the vaccine rollout to phase one um, high-risk populations, and she's now working on coordinating the vaccine rollout to congregate living center settings in Grey Bruce. Thank you, Andrea. I want to now thank Katie. Um, Katie joined the health unit in November 2020. And since that time, she's had a number of roles, including uh, manager of Healthy Babies, Healthy Children, manager wow. of the ID program, and now she's lead for the vaccine rollout. So we wanna thank Katie for jumping right in both feet and helping with uh, the various roles that need filled and leading us through the vaccine rollout. I also wanna thank uh, Jillian Jordan is another new manager mm -hmm. this year. Jillian joined our team in uh, December of 2020 and took on the role of school health manager, which is a big portfolio. So um, she jumped right in as well and was able to lead the school health team, um, bringing insight from her time with the infectious disease team to keep schools safe and healthy. And last but not least, I wanted to recognize Jason Wepler. Um, Jason has supported logistics, operations, and communications response to the pandemic. Most recently, he's been on site at all of the community hubs for the vaccine rollout, problem solving, and supporting staff within those rollouts. So thank you. And she also helps with communication, sorry. Thank you, Jason, for your assistance. Okay. So, be, go ahead, Dr. Guerra. Yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, to, to complete the list there, I, I just uh, need to mention, uh, or, or I'm going to turn it, sorry, to Matt, then I'll, I'll go a bit more about a uh, couple comments for, for the managers who mentioned too. <laughs> uh, thank you. So the, the first one I'd like to recognize is Christy. Uh, she is the manager of finance. She's doing a uh, uh, maternity coverage. Uh, so she came into it uh, after we had a uh, uh, a vacancy or a false start uh, with another person doing the, uh, uh, the leave coverage. It was a, a difficult uh, piece for her to step into, uh, but she leads a small but mighty team. Uh, they're quite agile, uh, rapidly changing needs that uh, showed up from the, uh, the COVID response, uh, particularly with our financial systems. Uh, and specifically the financial systems, while all this is going on, she's also stood up the uh, uh, a system software for budgeting that uh, integrates uh, into our financial system. Uh, that small but mighty team has also uh, morphed and uh, been able to handle the seven day work week uh, processes that this organization has uh, uh, also decided to pivot on. So uh, that's a systems change uh, and, and processing change uh, and the ability to do that and deal with uh, the, the multitude of new pay treatments uh, that we uh, needed to invoke uh, it has been awesome. On the procurement side, uh, another finance uh, responsibility. Uh, a couple of things, uh, when this pandemic first started, uh, we couldn't get N95 masks or hand sanitizer along with some other uh, clinical supplies. Uh, we had supply chain uh, breakage and, and uh, stall. Uh, through it all, though, procurement uh, made sure that we were never uh, without. 
uh, I would say it came close, but we were never without it. Uh, in near the end of this, uh, we had to, uh, we've also stood up inventory management, a complete uh, full inventory control system for our PPE uh, so that the hubs and the clinics are, are supplied, including staging and deploying uh, for mobile clinics. Uh, and the last piece is certainly uh, the reporting. Uh, all the additional governmental reporting required that uh, has landed upon us uh, completely uh, within uh, finances uh, uh, area of uh, both expertise and delivery. Uh, well done, thank you. Uh, the other manager I'd like to uh, recognize is uh, Darren, Darren Link. Uh, he has, he wears two hats. Uh, the first one is IT and the second one is maintenance. Uh, when I was talking with Darren, we were, we were going over the, uh, the projects and I literally have 39 projects that uh, have been kicked off over the, the, the beginning of this COVID uh, uh, response. Uh, some of the major ones, new phone system. Uh, com uh, a complete uh, uh, stand it up and put it out into the cloud. Uh, we've got uh, a movement from going from uh, no electronic to being fully Zoom eyesed, uh, being able to uh, push all our folks from, uh, it's probably the wrong word, so the, the push is a IT idea versus an actual physical, uh, but being allowing all our uh, staff to work at a distance. Uh, not tied specifically to the physical locale, so they can actually work from pretty much anywhere that they can have a, uh, a connection to the internet and our cell phones provide that as long as we have cell phone coverage. So uh, we have uh, dental uh, software upgrades, uh, a uh, co uh, vaccine uh, management uh, program, uh, a soft phone deployment uh, in the list literally is, is not quite endless, but is substantial. And that's another small but mighty team of four. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, Darren and uh, his team. Uh, the other side of the, the hat that he wears is on maintenance. Uh, while we go through this, maintenance also started with a man, with a one person down, another small but mighty team. And uh, we have, uh, we experience many things uh, that happen in the, the, the world of, running a facility such as ours. Uh, well, this is going, all the response we're going on and our changes to our facilities, including putting up barriers for our uh, cubicles. Uh, we had to do mundane things like put 20 new windows in, uh, uh, doing a glycol flush uh, through our uh, heating system, uh, just to improve the, uh, the overall efficiency of our, uh, uh, of our operations within this, uh, the, this office. Uh, the additional cleaning that's required with the high touch points, all additional things that uh, were done and uh, as well as bringing a, a new person on uh, during the year. So another small but mighty team. Thank you. Both to, to the maintenance, to Darren and his maintenance group. Turn the camera to me. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Um, Madam Chair, if I could just go through uh, recognition of the directors since they are managers as well, then that's what they do. But uh, before that, I, I just want to mention that uh, Christy joined our, our team in 2018, I believe, uh, when she was filling for uh, a leave. And uh, again, she came back uh, and she was so eager about public health and our team, and we are very lucky to have her on team. Uh, Jillian uh, is, is again uh, seeing how the, the different roles that uh, that were changed during the, the year and, and uh, you know leading the school team taking the lead on that uh, and, and continuing the good work that that is uh, quite amazing just to see how Jillian was growing into that role um, uh, regarding the directors uh, again I, I am gonna get emotional if I think of uh, Susan not here nevertheless uh, the, the stability and, and the uh, trust she brought in any and every juncture she had. She took care of COOP. COOP is the continuity of operation uh, plans and, and which is everything that the health unit does other than COVID and, and uh, ensuring that runs as one, one director to run all these uh, functions. She did amazing work and uh, I thank her for that. Um, Matt uh, has been 
instrumental in, in many projects and, and uh, uh, the different functions that can be done in, in corporate are, are really not uh, uh, the, the center of the attention of the pandemic. Nevertheless, every function and operation that we did, uh, whether it's the rollout of the vaccine or the opening of schools, uh, closing of schools, changing the on-call, changing the uh, to 24 seven, every one of these functions has uh, an equivalent and sometimes more uh, amount of work in the background and the corporate te team really delivered, whether it's uh, Christy and Darren or, or everybody. Um, IT did tremendous work, like not once my, my computer was in blackout uh, for, for any period that, that is significant, if any, that I can remember. And that just happens, nobody noticed it because it just didn't happen uh, because the work really invested in the background. Uh, Sarah um, was leading in IMS planning, then operation, then planning and worked on uh, during the, the uh, lockdown, uh, during the reopening at different functions and, and the school uh, process was nicely planned and started and she took the lead uh, in it, then she handed it over to Jillian nicely and the vaccine rollout and planning for it many roles and it's worth mentioning every operational manager actually was on call so they were doing most of these functions after hours to to support with the on-call team um, uh, Dana Leach uh, a manager that was the rock in, in uh, for, for the operation in uh, 2020 uh, she uh, took another job in 20. Uh, but at the end of 2020 in December uh, with one of our partners locally, uh, her work was, was instrumental in the first wave and the second wave, nicely completed both assignments and, and uh, we, we invited uh, Dana, uh, her, her time was not uh, um, aligned with the schedule, uh, hopefully next uh, month with, uh, with another opportunity for the retirement recognition, if the board would allow, we would extend the invitation again. Um, Dr. Lee was a manager in 2020, and she did a very nice job in, in the flexibility in, in leading planning, then uh, operation, and going back to planning and supporting the team in consultation was another uh, task. Um, and, and that really, um, I think, completes all the list except uh, for the communication manager and editor of Chief, uh, Drew. And I know um, I will not be able to say enough. Uh, Drew uh, worked on, on uh, every communication that came out in one way or the other, directly or indirectly. There was a team of uh, multiple uh, health promoter, different uh, staff that uh, we we have that worked in communication. Ian was was managing the team. Drew was managing the team, and uh, um, um, it, it has been just an honor to work with Drew. And and I can say a lot of things, but I know it's not going to do it justice. Uh, one request from the media came to Drew to say, uh, "Can you ask them wage?" what friendship he developed during the pandemic. And Drew was thinking, was like, you didn't see anybody except coming to work. And I was, I was, uh, I told him, well, let me think about it. It didn't take much thought. And he was surprised by the answer. Uh, I, I usually keep, keep the, the arm's lengths from being a friend with, with uh, coworkers or with employees. And that's a better practice because to be objective, to be able to help somebody to reach their potential. I, I cannot be as close as a friend. Uh, Drew obviously completed his, his uh, the, I, I think you reached the potential a long time ago. And, and the nature of emergency when, and the nature of the work to actually communicate and explore every idea and the wordsmithing of it. And, and um, it really, I couldn't deny that uh, it's a friendship, whether I, I, uh, I was aware of it developing or not, but it, it has been uh, really like a, a different stage in, in a way of me growing as a manager and realizing that a friendship can be there and, and uh, a, a true one. And uh, it's a privilege to work with you, Drew, and with every manager uh, around the table. I'll stop there, Madam Chair, and uh, open for any words from the, uh, from the board.
Thank you. And thank you, everyone. I want to say on behalf of the board, thank you. But that those two words are too small to say thank you. Like everything you do, we appreciate. And I know we thank Dr. Era all the time, but everyone knows he needs a team behind him to make it work. If it wasn't for everyone, and I mean everyone that works at, pu at the public health unit, we wouldn't be in the enviable position that we're in. So thank you very much for all you do. Any comments from the board? Other than we're all clapping for you. Yes, so. I, I just wanted to say, Sue, uh, just on the local level, you know, we have our emergency control groups and uh, as uh, I think was, it was, in, yes, it was in the video. You, we meet every week or nearly every week. I think we maybe missed, a, uh, went to every second week just when our numbers were way down for a month there. But basically it's been every week for a year and the health unit representative, uh, every call, and if the odd time maybe they weren't, it was because they were on another call with another municipality, uh, but um, very consistent. And we have appreciated that uh, expertise every week at our local level in the municipality of King Carden to support our staff. And... Uh, so uh, I want to thank, and I was, we've been thinking of all the managers, the health unit, uh, what a terrific job you've done. And, and uh, you know, all of a sudden having to work nearly every weekend, I'm sure some of you, uh, it's just to, to sustain it uh, for so long is marvelous. So thank you. Yes, thank you. Okay. Again, thank you very much, much appreciated. All right, so that ends our meeting, I believe. I'm not skipping anything again, sorry. Uh, so we need a motion to adjourn at 11.56. I have Brian Millen and Brian O'Leary. All in favor? That is carried. Thank you very much, good meeting. Thank and you all, have a nice weekend. Thanks, everyone. Have a good weekend. Bye. Bye, everybody. Take care, everyone.